We made it. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh my gosh, how incredible is this? This was definitely one of my favorite places that we've ever stumbled upon. What have we done? Did not think I'd be cuddling chickens today. Oh my gosh, my legs are still shaking. You got this, Kayla. We're Howard and Caitlin Newstate. Dog people, food people, adventure people. We've been living on the road for the past three and a half years, traveling through North America and beyond. Each week we bring you along with us to show you how to live like a local in every new state we visit. In our last episode, we braved the extreme cold in Colorado to make life-changing upgrades to our RV. I'm so excited. And our new lithium batteries from Enduro Power continue to blow us away. We are in absolutely no danger of ever running out of power. This week, we're leaving the warehouse and heading south to warmer weather and to a state we haven't explored much of. Welcome to New Mexico. Starting in the cultural mecca of Santa Fe. Oh, this is so pretty. It's so nice to be back in the desert. This is great. Wow. Hey, it's our first time boondocking the National Forest in a long time. Oh my gosh, it's been forever. Yeah, there's this huge National Forest only about 15 minutes outside of downtown Santa Fe. So it's perfect for setting up camp and exploring. Made it. Santa Fe. Santa Fe is New Mexico's state capital and the fourth largest city in the state. With a vibrant art scene, great dining, and a colorful history, it's no surprise it's become a tourism hotspot. We always try to find unique hidden gems on our trips, and our first stop was Cacao Chocolate House. This was definitely one of my favorite places that we've ever stumbled upon. Okay, so as many of you know, we, in 2020, were in Mexico for five months, and we made several stops, including a cacao farm. And then while I was in Teotihuacan and Caitlin was partying in Palm Springs, <laughs> uh, I also went to an authentic cacao bar where they serve all kinds of elixirs. So to find one here in Santa Fe was just a crazy coincidence. We had a chance to meet the owner too. She shared a lot of the really cool backstory of not just the different uh, types of chocolate, but the stories behind them. And then the fact that they make all of that in-house here in Santa Fe. So they have about six to eight on a daily basis that you can actually like sample and try and then order a cup of. And they sell all different kinds of bagged elixirs that you can take home and then froth and make on your own. I love that they call them elixirs too. I think that's kind of fun because it's like, <laughs> it's medicinal. The different flavor combinations too. Wow, I mean like the Jeffersonian, so different than the traditional Mexican one. Yes. I, I really like that one. I think there's a really neat story and connection with Thomas Jefferson and drinking chocolates, which I didn't know. I had no idea that he was a big proponent of bringing that here to the U.S. Caitlin definitely got her fill of all kinds of different <laughs> truffles. truffles. Uh, she had six, yes. six different truffles, I think, back to back to back to back to back. Uh, Caitlin, what was your favorite? Oh, I had two favorites. Definitely the horchata and the mezcal. And beyond the elixirs, they also have uh, tons of chocolates that they make also in-house. Uh, not just truffles, but they even had like chocolate covered chilies mm -hmm. as well. They also make caramels and then they have a ton of gluten-free brownies. And so I took home a little uh, peanut butter chocolate gluten-free brownie that I will be enjoying later. <laughs> We're getting ready to go into Loretto Chapel, but this isn't just any church. This is home of the Miraculous Staircase. The story of the Miraculous Staircase has even been featured on Unsolved Mysteries. No one knows who built this mysterious and ethereal structure. So we knew we needed to pay the five bucks to see it for ourselves. Construction on the church began in 1873 when the Sisters of Loretto, who had come to Santa Fe to start a school, decided they needed a chapel. It was designed and built by a French architect who sadly passed away before it was finished. So the sisters had no way of reaching the loft. Given the small size of the church, building a traditional staircase was out of the question because it would take up too much room and reduce the seating capacity. So they began a novena, a special nine-day prayer to St. Joseph, the patron saint of carpenters. Legend has it that on the ninth day, a mysterious man appeared with only a hammer and a carpenter square. And using simple pegs and wood that was not native to this area, he began the construction of the staircase. When he finished, he simply vanished without a trace and without receiving any payment. Some believe he was actually the patron saint himself. 
The unique architecture has stumped historians throughout the years. The spiral stairs have two 360-degree turns, no center support beams, and the entire weight of the staircase rests on the bottom stair. The local legend has now been featured in movies, TV shows, and books, and to see the stairs in person is certainly worth a visit of your own. As we mentioned, Santa Fe is the state capital of New Mexico, and it's also the oldest capital city in the U.S. You can take a self-guided tour of their beautiful capital building, known as the Roundhouse. It's the only circular capital building in the entire country. <laughs> Lots of superlatives here. So cool. It's much more like visiting in an art gallery than visiting a capital building. Like, there's so much beautiful and unique art everywhere you look. I was not expecting fossils on this tour. <laughs> it's an Alamosaurus. I've never heard of that. Okay, so we just got the secret hot tip from the governor's office uh, that there is beautiful art in the atrium. And the atrium is like, you go around the corner, you follow a bush, you go up this way, you go down that way. So we're following right now the carpet all the way to an elevator. The elevator's gonna take us to the basement. We go across the basement to the garage and that's where the atrium is. Okay, we're, we're back on the hunt. <laughs> we just got some additional instructions, and it sounds like we're really close. <laughs> Hot. Okay. Okay. Yep. Garage. Yep. Okay. Okay, garage. Good. This, this checks out. <laughs> this feels like a joke. <laughs> it does. It really does. Oh, yeah, this is definitely an atrium. Ah, yes. We made it. Hey, look. This is beautiful. Maybe we're in the atrium now, but this is actually the Walter Martinez Memorial Walkway. So if you're ever looking for this secret cache of art, it's in the walkway. Very cool. There is no shortage of great dining options in Santa Fe. We didn't even get to try every place on our list during this trip, but we found what is arguably the best happy hour in town. Dinner for Two has an extensive food and drink happy hour each day from four to six. The menu features dishes like oyster mushroom truffle risotto, beef tips with green chili queso, and El Pastor tacos, all priced at eight bucks and under. Definitely a New State Nomad's favorite. I'm so excited because we're going to do two of my all-time favorite things today. It includes puppies <laughs> and warm water. Would you believe that that's actually a combination that you can find here in Santa Fe? Oh, and you better believe we found it. We're gonna go take you there now. Welcome to Ojo Santa Fe Resort and Spa. About 15 minutes from downtown, this oasis has been a place of relaxation and rejuvenation for hundreds of years with its natural springs, creeks, and streams. Today you can visit as a day guest or book an overnight stay and soak in beautiful thermal pools, get pampered in the spa, or enjoy a delicious meal. Our first stop though was to visit the Puppy Patch, Ojo's on-site rescue and adoption center. We're partnered with Española Humane Society. All of our puppies are up for adoption option and they're all rescues and they stay here until they get adopted out. Oh my gosh, they're so cute. I mean, how could you not come here and like take one home? But no more dogs in the RV. No. <laughs> They've adopted out over 300 dogs. <laughs> Their goal is a puppy a day. So if you come here and you visit with the puppies, there's a good chance you might feel inclined to take a puppy home. I mean, how could you say no to these faces? Just look at them. Just look at them. They're so cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What'd you say, Art? I said we have enough dogs. But how can you say no to those eyes? No, I can. How? Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> One of the experiences you can have here is to meet with the silky chickens. And these are not the typical like farm chickens that you would think of. They're actually bred to be companion animals. We are so ready to see some <laughs> silky chickens. Are you excited? I, yeah, I'm, I'm still not clear on what the difference is between a silky chicken and a regular chicken, but I guess we're gonna find that out. <laughs> Gotta learn, yeah. they're silky. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Oh, hi guys. Just like a big handful, okay. and they'll eat it right out of your hand if you want them to. I recommend a much bigger hand. Really? Oh, okay. All <laughs> They'll right. go through it really fast. Okay, okay. I'm just, you know. And Mr. 
spidey pants over there. That's a pinchy mouth. I presume open hand, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bobby. Full opportunity. Everyone can get in. What's it feel like? Uh, it's well, it's my first silky chicken experience, and um, I can definitely I can see the silkiness thing. Yeah, <laughs> they kind of it almost looks I know it's feathers, but it looks it almost looks like fur. It almost looks like they have fur. It's really like fine feathers. A lot of people think that they're silky chickens because of like how soft their feathers are, but it's actually because they are from China and then they were traded along the Silk Road. Oh. Dang it. State uh, Silky Chicken is named because of the Silk Road, um, the ancient trade path from China. Yeah. As in silk, silky chicken. So I guess it's just a coincidence that they also happen to be very soft. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is, it's starting to sound like an urban legend as I'm <laughs> saying it. If you know the answer, please let us know in the comments. Oh my gosh, how incredible is this? We have our own private soaking tub. There's a fireplace right here. We can turn the jets on and off. We can swivel the slats. So if you want privacy or if you want to overlook the pools, there's water, there's towels, there's a steam room. I'm in heaven. You can book private 50 minute soaking sessions. This is one of their Ojito pools, good for a couple or small group. They also have soaking tubs that they describe as perfect for one person or cozy for two. All of them overlook the beautiful pools and landscape below. This has been very nice and an hour goes by really fast. It's super relaxing, but now we're off to try something I've never done before. It's the float room. We have made it to the float tank. And so first step is to shower off. So I'm gonna do that and then hop in and you've got earplugs and you're supposed to just, I think, desensitize like everything. And so you just float from the buoyancy of the salt. Um, I don't really know what to expect here. <laughs> Everything like I've read and heard, it's a really like cool experience, but I think it's gonna feel a little weird. He said it's a really nice place to meditate. Okay. Whoa. I'm a big fan of that. You're in there and you are completely weightless. Like the buoyancy, like from the salt, you're just floating and it's all dark and quiet. And it's so nice just to be able to like shut out the outside world and just have some time to like truly relax. And now I gotta wash all the salt off. <laughs> You really can spend an entire day at Ojo Santa Fe, especially because there's a delicious on-site restaurant serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We had green chili fries to start, and you know I love a good burger, so I got the bison burger and Howard had fish tacos. All of it was excellent, but they are in the process of revamping their menu, and we had a chance to chat with Santa Fe culinary legend, Chef Carmen Rodriguez, about a few of the new items. This is capirotada. Capirotada is a New Mexican bread pudding, so they use cheese as their binder instead of eggs. So in the waffle, it's uh, chimayo red chili, ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon, and white cheddar cheese with a uh, buttermilk malted waffle. This is on the new breakfast menu. And on top is a compote of apple, currant, coconut, and a little bit more cinnamon. And just a little touch of rum that cooks out. And then we top it with whipped cream and a candy pecan. And I am so excited. I wish that you guys could smell how amazing this smells. All right, well, the official verdict is it is absolutely delicious. All the, the flavor combination is phenomenal. And Chef was explaining to us how every dish has a story and is really drawing on the heritage of the area and all of the different cultures, which makes the dish like you appreciate it that much more. Hey, it's like target practice or something. I'm really excited. I don't even know. What already yeah, done? I've been told 
We might be throwing an axe. I don't know. Have you ever thrown a hatchet before? No. Okay. <laughs> That's the answer I mostly get. Okay. So it's unlike throwing a baseball. When you throw a baseball, you open up to your side body, you kind of use your whole torso, put it in, you know, into the throw. Yeah. Um, you don't want to do that. Just forget all that. <laughs> it's actually more like bowling, which sounds strange, right? What could possibly go wrong? Okay, that was low. Now I know I have to, I gotta throw harder. Too low. Howard finally got the hang of it. Let's see. You don't think so? I did not get the hang of it. I'd like to point out, I got maybe one out of every four actually to stick. It's hard because the rotation thing, I, man. Yeah, it's like you have to think about so much like hand-eye coordination and everything, so. Okay. Close. So, getting close. Yes! Did you feel that? Yes. Okay. You, you got all those in there at those perfect angles. This precision, you wouldn't believe it. This one was like a slide thing, a side sling. Crazy. Howard's doing trick shots now and everything. That was a workout. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it than just chucking an axe. I had no okay. idea. All right, how has your time here been? <laughs> it's been great so far. I feel like this is definitely not just a spa, right? And if you're thinking, oh, if I'm not in the spa stuff, I'm not gonna have a good time. That couldn't be further from the truth. As we've just shown, you can throw axes here. <laughs> you can meet chickens. You can meet dogs. You can relax by the pools. They have all these different pools. We're gonna go check out a couple right now. This is great. The really great advantage of staying here on the property is you get a full three hours of bonus time at the beginning of the day from 7 to 10 a.m., right? Yes, 10 a.m. is when they open to the public, but their guests get to go and enjoy all the pools. It's awesome. It's like having private pools. <laughs> you get one of these key cards when you have a day pass, and that gives you access behind the gate, which is where all the pools are, and there's different meandering walkways. Really cool. Do we have to leave? No, actually we don't. <laughs> we don't have to leave for at least a little while. Yeah, they're open till 10 o'clock at night, guys. So now we're in, Caitlin calls them the cauldrons, but they like- do look, They're these beautiful cauldron-shaped thermal pools, and it's right on the natural spring, and it's just so peaceful. But of course, this is hot water. We're in a, we're in a heated pool. Oh yeah, it's yeah. very warm. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. And then they have these hammocks that you can relax in, and little cabanas, it's just, the vibe out here is just so nice. A waterfall next to us. Yeah, and statues, and just the elements and the attention to detail. And I see like lighting starting to come out now that it's getting dusk. I think it's gonna be really pretty at night. Well, Scout is wearing her very winter outfit because it's actually snowing in New Mexico right now. I know, we're in the desert and there's snow on the ground. Yeah. It's been beautiful, but not necessarily conducive to what we had planned. Yeah, so we're gonna switch it up real quick and actually head out of town so we can show you other parts that are close by to Santa Fe, but maybe without snow. Well, welcome to a chilly Los Alamos. This place has been on Howard's bucket list for a very long time, and there's so much fascinating history here. There is. Uh, Los Alamos, if you don't know, is the birthplace of the atomic weapon and famously called the Manhattan Project. And today we're going to be learning all about that and heading around the town. Now, I also didn't know that the labs are still very much so in existence. And today, up to 12 or 13,000 people yeah. work, work here. There. Yeah, we just stopped at the visitor center, which is what we always highly recommend to do. So we got our stamps and got a lot of information, kind of a lay of the land. 
and our first stop is the Bradbury Science Museum. What we also learned from the Visitor Center was that many of the structures from the Manhattan Project are not here anymore. And in fact, they were very temporary and intentionally designed just for the Manhattan Project and then tragically torn down. Torn down. <laughs> um, but there are still some that remain um, because they were actually here before. We also learned there was a boys' school uh, that was here, a very elite boys' school, and those yeah, like, structures are still there. Only the wealthy could attend this boys' school, and there was a branch of the Boy Scouts that is still active today, and it's the third oldest in the country. Yeah, which is amazing. Well, that was a really interesting museum, and what I got out of it was that it's not just so much about creating the next nuclear weapon, but rather it's about maintaining the current stockpile, testing to make sure that it is as effective as a deterrent, um, but then also all the other research that they still do at this facility. This is truly a meeting of amazing scientists from all over the world who are supporting some of the most incredible projects. I think something that I thought was really interesting too is they talk about how of course the uh, discovery or the creation of the atomic bomb changed the course of history but how much of a deterrent it really is to all of these countries and like how leaders will try everything to de-escalate a situation because nobody wants to actually use their nuclear weapons. Right. I thought that was actually a really fascinating take on it. That's such a great point. Yeah, the, the, the act of deterrent. Like they interviewed one scientist and they were asking like, you know, do you think that that work that was done here has really actually helped to protect the world. He was like, absolutely. So it's just a, a different way to look at nuclear bombs. They also talk about some of the other science they're doing here. And it includes, I mean, it's literally everything from creating uh, fuel from algae uh, to work on viruses. I thought that was actually mm -hmm. very interesting, particularly in a COVID era. Yeah. Yeah, you can, there's a whole touch screen and you can like touch the viruses, drag them over and then read about them. Um, there's a lot of really interactive exhibits. So if you're not necessarily like, oh, I'm not really into learning about nuclear weaponry, there's a lot more here and it's completely free. So we'd highly recommend checking it out. It's a fantastic free museum. Yeah. Los Alamos is probably not on everyone's list, but maybe it should, uh, particularly because of all the aspects beyond just nuclear weapons that are done even today at the Los Alamos labs. Yeah, I've learned a lot. We've only been here for a couple of hours, so well worth it. We had a great night actually staying right here. We were at a brewery that is part of the Harvest Host program. Um, we've had the membership for several years and admittedly, this is one of the few times we've ever used it, but I gotta say, this location is perfect for exploring Los Alamos. Oh, it's right in the center of all of the action, like everything that you could possibly want to visit. We just parked yesterday and then we're able to walk everywhere, pop in, take the dogs out when we needed to. And then we were able to finish the night with delicious beer right here and yeah. walk home. And they look at this, I mean, they have a great patio and everything. And the uh, site for parking is like directly behind. Yeah. And they had a nice little welcome packet and all that. I mean, this is like super nice. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Harvest Hose, we'll have a link in the description below so you can learn more. Orange RV parking only. What? Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. How's that for a first time? Super cool. Reserved parking if you're 25 feet and over. So to get to Bandelier National Monument, uh, you have to drive through, I guess maybe alongside of Los Alamos Labs. And so there is a ominous looking security gate and you uh, just present a photo ID, tell them where you're heading and then they provided basic instructions. Yeah, they said no left turns and no photos and there are cameras everywhere so don't try it. Yeah. <laughs> and you just kind of drive through and then you're in like a ponderosa forest and then you can take photos and video and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And now we're here at Bandelier National Monument. And I think first up is lunch. Yeah, we are starving. Home of the best burgers in New Mexico. <laughs> well, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> what have you done? Wow. <laughs> I'm not even 100% how you're supposed to eat this, but we're gonna try our best. So this is the chili, mm -hmm. right? Yep. 
Yep, and then under all of that deliciousness is a red bean patty. There's green chilies, I think, mm -hmm. on here. We got mozzarella. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. The burger has a really cool story behind it. It's called The Doug. And he said a park ranger came in one day and was like, I heard you make the best burgers. Can you make me one? And he was like, can we put anything we want on it? And they were like, yeah. So they did. They have like 25 or 30 different ingredient toppings that you can get on the burger. Okay, we are fed. We are now hydrated. And we are heading to the Pueblo Main Loop, which is like the quintessential hike that you do. I am really going to loosely use the term hike because from what I understand, it's mostly paved the entire way. There are a couple of ladders that we will be needing to scale. I'm very excited about that. So to look for this. This is a parrot. Now parrots are not in any way indigenous to this area, but this proves that the people who lived here had extensive trade routes and so therefore they had access to places that did have parrots because otherwise, why would they draw a parrot? Huh, that's so cool. Okay, I know in this digital age, it's still hard to believe, but there are books. This is a $2 book. You cannot find this information online. There's no PDF version of it. It is a physical book that is available at the visitor center or the bookstore, and it corresponds to numbers. Oh, it's talking about the canyon in the Mesa country. Uh, so it talks about the eruptions that occurred here. It was 600 times more powerful than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. So this, according to the book, contained 400 rooms and 100 people lived here. This used to be, I think, up to two stories tall. Just incredible. Look at the size of some of these rooms, though. Oh, really yeah. small. Tiny. Yeah. Decision as to whether you lived in, uh, up in the caves or down here was really not based on status or anything. It was whoever got here first because the more desirable was to actually be up there uh, because uh, there was better shelter and the sun would heat the rock, which would keep it warm in the winter. And when he says up there, that's where he means. This is a cave eight. Smoking the ceilings would harden the tuff and make it less crumbly. Oh. So this was intentional. Yeah. And a nice little window. <laughs> Super cool. Very cool. Filming while going down the stairs is not advised. Uh, these are very steep and treacherous steps. <laughs> Caitlin, don't film while we're going down the stairs. That's why I'm not, because you know me, I'm clumsy so. <laughs> It would not be good. There are, the handrails are extensive. I will say that. You do have a safe place where you can grab a hold of something as you go down. Oh, it got really narrow here. Woo. I understand now why they say it will take like an hour to an hour and a half, even though it's only a mile, because you want to stop and like look at everything and every corner that you go around, it's something new and different. And there's a different perspective. I would also add safety, uh, that you shouldn't <laughs> you go fast. Time, yeah. yeah. This is Cape Kiva, it was rebuilt. And the reason why it's so perfectly black is because the parks have to keep smoking it over and over again because of the amount of graffiti, which is sad, but yeah, it really gives you an idea. Look at how big this space is. Look at the handprints. Uh, those are not native or indigenous. <laughs> We have found the parrot. It's in that shadowy area there. It's, it's clearly, it look, it's either a parrot or a dinosaur. <laughs> I mean, that looks like what was on the sign. Yeah, that is amazing. You did it. Yeah. There's a deer like up and diagonal from it too, which is pretty cool. I actually saw the deer first before Howard saw the parrot. I'm glad we stopped there. 
How fun. Oh, that's so cool. All right, mission accomplished. We can go. No. <laughs> I'm joking. There's more to see. <laughs> Halfway through the Pueblo Loop Trail, a choice must be made. Do you turn back towards the visitor center or continue another half mile each way to Alcove House? If you have a fear of heights, you should not attempt this climb. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I found a picture online and they are ladders that go like straight up. And there's four of them in order to get all the way up. I'm doing it. You got to face your fears. I'm going to do it. Okay, let's go. Before I change my mind. She'll be fine. So we're here in March and there is still snow on the ground. We are now on the other side of the canyon. So uh, the original statement regarding the paved path is no longer applicable. We are on a dirt path with a light amount of ice on top. Okay, Caitlin, are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. This first one looks like about 20 rungs on the ladder. One down. <laughs> okay, first one wasn't bad. No problem. Okay, here we go. Yep. Wow. <laughs> One handed. Kaylin, you did it. Okay. I found that if I just, if I don't look up and I just focus on the rungs in front of me, then I'm okay. Well. But if I think, if I think about how high I am, then I'm not okay. I didn't like that one. You did it. <sighs> Last couple steps. <sighs> that was aerodynamically hard. I mean, aerobically hard. Coming? <laughs> it's only halfway done now. We gotta go back down. <laughs> well, high five. <sighs> I'm glad I did it. It wasn't too bad. No. But look at, I mean, look at the view, though. Oh my gosh, my legs are still shaking. We have one more to go. Oh, we're doing it. Oh. You got this, Kim. Last ladder. Woo! <laughs> I'm very happy about that concludes the aerobic portion of this event. It was definitely a workout from not only like the physical aspect, but the mental challenges of it as well. I'm very proud. <laughs> Caitlin is not the biggest fan of heights. Yeah, if you recall like that bridge on our way to McCarthy, there's been numerous things. Uh, paragliding, <laughs> the things that Howard talks me into, but I'm always glad that I did it after the fact. Um, so I would definitely recommend that if you're going to do the main loop trail to add on some time or make sure you budget time to do this as well because it is super cool. It is really cool. I kind of wish there was more interpretive material or something to help us better understand <laughs> what, we're looking, what we're looking at once we were up there. Yeah. But uh, it is really impressive. It's very cool. Even if you don't want to climb it yourself, there are a bunch of benches where you can sit and watch people do it and get a great view of the cliff sides and the ladders and all of that too. So just know that's an option as well. The peanut gallery was definitely full <laughs> yeah. uh, on our way up. Next week, we continue our road trip through New Mexico, stopping in one of the most uniquely named towns in the country, home to amazing hot springs and rocket ships. You won't want to miss the story behind truth or consequences. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.